sophisticated process of how an embryo com comes from a very simple to a very complex state. I believe the same thing happens in human evolution, that there is an intelligent evolutionary force living in each human body, everybody in this room, that guides hominid and human development. It is expansive in nature and selectively adapts to wider and wider circumstances, leading to greater and greater realms of awareness, consciousness, and expressive behavior in the world. I'm going to return to that. I'm going to want to jump over to another area and set a pillar so that we can have a firm foundation for what we're going to talk about next. Now, a brief foray into, the his, into history and archaeology before we plunge into the psycho spiritual dynamics of Osiris and Kundalini. By 15 to 20,000 years BCE, the Earth is populated by different tribes of Africoid human beings undergoing various degrees of skin, hair, nose, eye adaptations, and so forth. Those Africans who went into Europe, often called the Grimaldi Negroids, after a place the bones were found in Grimaldi, Spain, become the foundation for the later European races, the Alpine and so forth, uh, European races. They are um, isolated in the ice. In order to adapt, those Africans have to undergo certain surface uh, phenotypical changes. The nose elongates over time, and that's adapted because it helps warm air coming through the nose and goes into the lungs. Uh, more clothes are worn, the sun hits it less, uh, the sin, the, also the skin gets lighter. There's, there's a whole involved sequence about metabolism of vitamin uh, D, which is much too complicated to get into in the short time we have, but that contributes to the change in the lightening of the skin. Also, uh, white skin is more adaptive to cold climates. It is, it is much more resistant to frostbite than dark skin. During the Korean War, uh, uh, African American soldiers had three to four times as many frostbite cases as white soldiers did. Why? Because black skin does not deal as well with the cold as white skin does. It's merely an adaptation. The hair gets longer to protect the body, and that there's a thicker body built to retain heat. Loads, as I said, gets longer, more narrower. There are lots of just surface adaptations that occur. Cause spingling is common, and commerce is fairly common during this time. But at this time, 15, 20,000 years um, BC, there's no written script to speak of. Um, there's no metallurgy really to speak of. There's experimental with crop farming, uh, crop farming mostly in Africa, and cattle domestication also in Africa. Now, African tribes have migrated to Europe, Asia, Australia, the South Sea Islands, Japan, and even over into Bering Straits of both, into both North and South America, again, everywhere except Antarctica. Then, then a new quantum leap in human consciousness uh, begins with a cataclysmic change in the ecology. The great lush Sahara, once full of lakes, rivers, varied animal life, begins to dry up. We have satellite pictures of this now, where we, have, we can clearly see the outline of lakes riverbeds and so forth, this huge complex in the Nile Valley, it began to dry up. That was a cataclysmic change. It was also during that time when the Nile Valley was very lush that the Sphinx was built. If you look at the base of the Sphinx, it has a lot of water erosion marks. You don't get water erosion marks in a desert. It was built during a time in which it was lush with animal life, which indicates that there was a very high civilization prior to what we even know in Egypt and Nubia. A reference to this is Serpent in the Sky. Oh, there's also, interestingly enough, a, uh, a video out about this. Uh, and I've seen the video, and most of it's pretty good, but even the video skirts some of the issue. It can't quite cop to the idea that these were African peoples. And they sort of talk around it. And you can read through the lines. Um, but uh, they just don't quite come out and uh, mention it. Uh, and it's most uh, obvious when they're talking about the, uh, the uh, space of the Sphinx. Um, many people think that, or it was held for a long time, that Pharaoh uh, Kephron um, was the figure for the Sphinx. And they're finding out now that it's probably not. They're reconstructed uh, uh, by computer graphics, the face of the Sphinx. 
and he would have to have an extremely long nose to be able to do that. So it was obviously it was an African face. Uh, the uh, Sphinx did not look the way it looked until recently. When Napoleon, remember, Napoleon went into Egypt, and at that time, uh, Africans were being brought out in droves to become slaves in the Caribbean. And until this time, people had, in Europe, were praising ancient Egypt as a source of civilization and so on and so forth. When Napoleon's troops go into Egypt, they, they find the Sphinx, they see it, and they freak. And because he looks like the people who have been enslaving. So Napoleon's lieutenants blow off the nose of the Sphinx. It's a threatened return of the repress. And mm -hmm. philosophically at that time, uh, European scholars become significantly less interested in classical Egyptian civilization, and they begin to get interested in ancient Indian civilization, and they begin talking about Indo-Aryan civilization. So racism is not just the province of, you know, also very much among the academics, except when the academics do it, they, they smile. <laughs> <laughs> so about 10 to 20, 15,000 years ago, or rather 10 to 12,000 years ago, great migrations from the west and center of Africa begin, leading to a confluence of commerce and cultures around the Nile Valley. There are not hordes of people coming in from the Middle East into Africa at this time. There are trickles of people, but not huge numbers. And there are not tremendous numbers of people coming in from Europe into the Nile Valley. This, this is a movement from the indigenous peoples of Africa to create that civilization. Nubia arises in present-day Sudan and Ethiopian, high, and Ethiopian highlands. The first written experiments with scripts appear in Nubia. The first pharaohic structures appear in Nubia. The first experimentation with a pyramid begins in Nubia. The first metallurgical science begins in Nubia. The first exacting astronomy begins in Nubia. And most important for our discussion tonight, the first theory of salvation begins to take effect in Nubia. Uh, Walter Fair Service has an excellent book on the ancient kingdoms of the Nile and the dune monuments of Nubia in reference to the Nubia being anterior to even Egyptian civilization. Um, reality of the matter is that Egyptian and Nubian civilization are so close, it's really difficult to separate the two. The Egyptians and the Nubians did not make a distinction between each other in terms of race. They did it in terms of culture to some extent, but not in terms of phenotype. And they did make a distinction between themselves and the Semitic peoples and the European peoples, but not between Egyptian and Nubian peoples. That again is a little another way to divide people uh, scholastically and academically, the same way that African peoples uh, in Africa and Africoid peoples in southern India, i.e. the Dravidians, are thought of as different peoples. They are very close genetically, historically, and otherwise. For references, I suggest Cheikh Anta Diop's African Origin of Civilization and also uh, J.G. Jackson's Introduction to African Civilizations. Also, uh, description of daily life. Uh, among the peoples of the Nile Valley. There's an excellent description in Black Man of the Nile and His Family by the eminent elder, Dr. Yosef ben Yachnan. So, the Egyptian-Nubian lands, that's how I'm going to refer to it, as Egyptian-Nubian. Egyptian-Nubian lands are referred to as Kemet, or Land of the Blacks. And there are 15 different ways to spell it. Choose the one that you want. But that's basically uh, what it means, that Kemet means Lands of the Blacks. Uh, a number of things begin to happen here that are very important. Uh, medicine, medicine, medicine begins to arise in this part of the world. And it arises because of the need for mummification and also battlefield surgery. There are huge battles going on here, but when you begin to mummify uh, the bodies of the dead, you begin to learn a lot about it. And that's where many of the fact, many of the different anatomical terms come from. The Egyptians had over 200 anatom different anatomical terms or different anatomical parts of the body that they had identified. Dr. Charles Finch's book, uh, a physician, Dr. Charles Finch's book, African Background to Medical Science is an excellent book on this area. Also, uh, if you want to go to the pirated originals, it's now called the Edwin Smith Papyrus, not because Edwin Smith wrote it, but because he happened to be an Egyptologist studying, came across the manuscript and took it back uh, for, quote, safekeeping, unquote, 
to uh, his music.